Notice the statement by Dr. Herzog, who's professor of archaeology at Tel Aviv University. This is the largest university in Israel, and you would expect that professor of archaeology there would be one who is telling you about things that support the Bible, but that's not the case. In our country, many of the universities which used to do that now are dominated by those who oppose the Bible. So we have statements like this. He says, this is what archaeologists have learned from their excavations in the land of Israel. The Israelites were never in Egypt, did not conquer the land in a military campaign, and did not pass it on to the 12 tribes of Israel. That's what we've learned from the study of archaeology. Now, why would a fellow who is professor of archaeology in Israel make a statement like that? We have to put this in a larger political context. And I think we can see that context if we compare it with a statement made by the late Yasser Arafat, who is former president of the Palestinian Authority. And I think you can appreciate why he would make a statement similar to this. He says, the notion of a Jewish origin in Jerusalem is a religious myth used to justify occupation and colonialism. Well, he's fighting a political battle. He says there never was a temple in Jerusalem. And there is no archaeological evidence anywhere this is a myth. Many of the secular Jews don't really care that much about the, the religious battle, but they know there's a lot of uh, mad Palestinians. There are a lot of, uh, there's a war going on. And they like to live in peace. They don't like their malls being blown up, and so you just don't say things that aggravate them. So it's... Uh, not going to help those who are religiously inclined, but so what? Peace is more important. This is the context that we see this battle going on in the middle of. In spite of the effort to establish Palestinians' right to the land or the Jewish right to the land based on archaeology, we need to just back up and, and look at the evidence and see what the actual facts are. And that's, of course, going to be our approach. We want to see what the evidence is for the Bible, for the history of Israel, from the stones of Israel. And I want to begin with the altar of Joshua, and I believe that's exactly what it is, on Mount Ebal. In Deuteronomy 27, we find the instructions given, When you've crossed over the Jordan, you shall set up these stones about which I'm commanding you today on Mount Ebal, and you shall cover them with plaster build an altar to the Lord with uh, an altar uh, of stones on which you've not used an iron tool. And so it's a very specific type of altar. They wrote the law in the plaster. They were excellent stone cutters at this time, just phenomenal stone cutters, but no stones that were cut were to be used here. Verse 11 says, the same day Moses charged the people as follows, when you've crossed over, uh, You'll stand on the Mount Gerizim for a blessing. Then verse 13 says, You'll stand on Mount Ebal for the curse. That This is a, a good teaching method. We're going to read you the law. Now then, here's half of the group on this mountain and half of the group on the other mountain, and you're going to recite what's going to happen if you keep this law, and then the others are going to recite what's going to happen if you don't keep this law. And here are the blessings, here are the cursings. Uh, they understood exactly what happened, and of course we see those things taking place as they obeyed or as they didn't obey. But this altar was the center of that event. This is up in Samaria, and here we can see Mount Ebal, and nearby Mount Gerizim. Dr. Adam Zertal is chairman or was chairman of the Department of Archaeology at the University of Hoffa. He was an atheist. He was taught in his education that uh, Joshua, Moses, David, Solomon were all fictitious creatures like Zeus, and uh, you don't believe this foolishness. But he's an archaeologist, and he begins to look at what you can find from archaeology, and he uh, took the area of Manasseh, and over a period of about 20 years was doing a survey, meter by meter, of that area to see what could be found. 
and he found an altar. Well, he, nobody was ready to admit this was an altar on Mount Gerizim. They'd looked on top, and it wasn't there. And so they assumed the altar that you read about in Deuteronomy wasn't there. Of course, the high places were reserved for the idols. You study the Old Testament. Literally, it says this altar was in the mountain. It's about two-thirds of the way up. And when he came across this doing his survey, he reported it in the journals. Could this be Joshua's altar? Uh, and there was uh, just a, a guffaw, a just ridicule. Lawrence Staggers, professor of archaeology at, uh, of Israel at Harvard University, says, If a sacrificial altar stood on Mount Ebal, its impact on our research is revolutionary. All of us have to go back to kindergarten. Because they're teaching that none of this happened. There's no Exodus, there's no Moses, and no Joshua. But here's the altar, just as it's described in Deuteronomy. Well, it's not really an altar. It's a, it's a farmhouse, or it's a watchtower. Okay, but it's not on top of the mountain, and it's short and squatty. Not a very good watchtower. doesn't have any windows and any doors. <laughs> not make a very good farmhouse. What is it? Well, they began to look, and we'll let Adam Zertal, in his own words, tell you the implications of this. If there was an altar on Mount Ebal, uh, the uh, most ancient and the first uh, Jewish or Israelite altar here, the meaning is that all the story of Deuteronomy and parts of the story in Joshua are scientifically true. This is, I think, absolutely so, and even the enemies understood it, and so they opposed it. Here we see the altar looking across to Mount Gerizim, uh, where the blessings were read. And I, one of the things that struck me when I was there, how do you get a group over here and a group that far away, and you hear each other? We sent Dr. Willie Dye across to the other side. He has, by the way, six earned doctorates, <laughs> Uh, archaeology from uh, Berkeley. He went across and we yelled as loud as we could yell, Dr. Dye, can you hear us? He said, yeah, I can hear you. <laughs> <laughs> the acoustics were just, well, you can't believe it till you're there. It, it's, it's just astounding. Uh, it was it apparently just designed to accomplish exactly what was done. As he continued to excavate and, and look at this area, we find a large complex here where a large group of people were obviously camped. It's been restored to look like this. And obviously this short, squatty building with the ramp going up, no steps, is exactly what we see described in Deuteronomy. Probably looked like this with uh, its being covered by plaster. And we're reminded there in uh, verse 25 of Exodus 20 that it was not to be made of cut stones. You'll not go up by steps. This is in contrast to all of the Canaanite altars uh, that you might find in the area. But exactly what you find. Well, what, what do you find in the center? Well, they begin to dig down into the, the, the center of the area, and they found it was full of ashes. Isn't that a surprise? Uh, some of the vessels there had ashes in them. And they allowed these ashes to be examined at uh, the Department of Zoology at the University of Hoffa. They found 942 bones, indicating some 50 to 100 individuals. And what kind of animals were these? If this was a Canaanite altar, they'd be sacrificing eagles and snakes and various animals. But not so with the Israelites. What they found were sheep and goats and cattle, all kosher animals, if you please. And of the ones that they could determine, the sex and the age, all of them were one-year-old males. Wow, this is not a Canaanite altar. It's not a farmhouse. It's not a watchtower. Pottery was also found, and both culturally and uh, with thermoluminescent dating, which is most appropriate for pottery. It was dated to the time of the Exodus, approximately the 13th century. In addition, he found Egyptian scarabs that came from Egypt. This is used often to date uh, Egyptian artifacts. 
This is from Ramses II, which is probably the one who was reigning at the time of the Exodus, though it's not precise. But generally the time of the Exodus. All of this fits and makes a picture that's just very impressive. It was an honor to be a part of the excavation there. But let's notice the statement by Adam Zertal, who was convinced as a result of this and other evidence that he uncovered that the Old Testament was God's Word. And not only that, that the Messiah that the Old Testament predicted uh, was the Christ. And he is a believer in Christ and has established a church up there in Samaria, independent of any denominational organization. Uh, they're teaching what appears to be New Testament Christianity to me, baptism for remission of sins, and uh, about a group of 40 up there in, in the middle of Palestinian territory. He published this material uh, over a, a series of years, a number of uh, articles as each was discovered, and then made this comment, what has happened regarding the new accumulation of facts I have cited? almost nothing. Since the appearance of the detailed report and the many articles I have published on the excavation, silence has descended on the scholarly world. They have nothing to say. Well, I do. Uh, I think Professor Staggard needs to go back to kindergarten. That's what he said, and I, I agree with him. We find that Adam has continued to work and decided that he would look in the area that the Bible indicated would be Gilgal. This is where they first camped when they came across the Jordan. No one had really investigated here because most of the archaeologists had no confidence that this was a true story anyway, and they hadn't looked. And so he went to look. In Joshua chapter 4, the people came up from the Jordan on the 10th of the first month, camped at Gilgal on the eastern edge of Jericho. Well, that's pretty specific. Now, here's where it is. Those 12 stones which had taken from the Jordan, Joshua set up at Gilgal. Well, he found the spot and found more than he anticipated finding. Uh, just was amazed. Uh, here is the diagram that he has from his research. It's in the shape of a shoe. Now, at the heel, you find a configuration that fits precisely the dimensions of the tabernacle, which is what they set up here when they came across. Out on the toe, you find a circular area there that we'll look at again in a moment. But what is this about? And as he thought about it, he reflected back on Deuteronomy chapter 11, where Moses told them, every place on which the sole of your foot treads shall be yours. Your border will be from the wilderness to Lebanon, from the river to the Euphrates, as far as the western sea. And then Joshua said in chapter 1, Every place on which the sole of your foot treads, I have given it to you, just as I've spoken to Moses. The people got there, and they set up this area to make the claim, This is ours. <laughs> and they set up this uh, double pathway of stones, the pathway in between the, the two rows of stones, in the shape of a foot, and evidently they marched around, perhaps with the Ark of the Covenant, saying, basically, this is ours. And that uh, heel portion that you can see again is exactly the dimensions of the tabernacle. And that circular area down near the toe has just been, that hasn't been published yet. You won't be able to read this possibly until next year. But in the middle of that circular altar, appearing is 12 standing stones. I think that's awesome. <laughs> I know where those stones came from, I believe. But here is a picture of that double pathway that surrounds and defines this foot where they were making, I believe, the claim. This, this country is, is ours. As you look at this off in the distance, you see Jericho. It's on the eastern edge, just exactly where the Bible indicated it should be. As we go to Jericho, of course, a very famous area and where a great deal of archaeological work has been done, we recall Joshua chapter 6, verse 3, you'll march around the city, all the men of war, you'll do so for six days. The priests carry the ram's horns, they blow the ram's horns, the trumpets, the walls 
fall down on the seventh day so that the people will go up straight ahead. Pretty amazing story. Not exactly a, uh, a reasonable sounding battle plan. Just march them to death, go around and around, and it's, it falls down. Well, this, this is not an, a normal plan. This is a supernatural plan. And a lot of archaeologists have been here. The original archaeologist, Garstang, did uh, work in the early 1900s, was confident this was Joshua's Jericho. Uh, but then that was refuted, we're told. There is a cable car that allows you to go up over the tell, which you see here in the circle. This is the mound where the ancient city is found, and quite a bit of excavation can be seen from the air. Uh, not too many people riding the cable car nowadays. This is the Hamas headquarters. <laughs> they haven't quite got the knack of promoting tourism there, at shooting everybody. Uh, but after Garstang had done his work, uh, Kathleen Kenyon took over. She's one of the ones who we're told has modernized archaeology in Israel. And she says the city belonged to a much earlier time and could not be biblical Jericho based on the absence of the imported Cypriot ware pottery. This is special pottery from Cyprus. That should be there if this is Joshua's time. And there's some fairly reasonable conclusions uh, regarding that. She dug and she didn't find it. And so she concluded it couldn't be Joshua's Jericho. She did acknowledge that things were burnt and the walls had fallen. The lack of pottery proved that it could not be Joshua's Jericho. And then she died. <laughs> Fortunately, uh, we'll have more to say about her later. Bryant Wood began to work there in the late 90s and after the turn of the century and found exactly what she said would indicate that it was Joshua's Jericho, but she says it wasn't there. He found that it was. This is expensive pottery. She was digging in the poor part of the city. He said you ought to look in the prosperous part, and he found lots of it. And we, by the way, do have an excellent example of that Cypriot pottery back in the museum, the artifact room, that you can examine. But not only did he find the pottery that she said would indicate Joshua's Jericho, he found a continuous series of Egyptian scarabs with dated inscriptions. I mean, how do you nail it down any better? An unbroken series extended from the 18th century B.C., way before the Exodus, up to the time of the conquest where it stops. An unbroken series right up to the time of the conquest, and it's over. There's no way to establish it any better than that. He found a number of things, some of which Kenyon had found, uh, the remains of a fortified tower, storage containers that were had in indicated were full of grain at the time that it was burned, Normally, you wouldn't find that with a conquered city because grain is, is a commodity much like uh, our money today. And so the people that conquer it take the grain, but they didn't here. Well, we know they were to commanded not to take things from Jericho. And furthermore, in Joshua chapter 3, we're told that when they came across the Jordan, this was at the time of the harvest and so the storage containers would be full, and they would leave them full, and then the burned city is piled on top of it. Again, confirming what we find. He found the retrievement wall at the base of the tell that had reinforced it. He found the fallen brick outside that retrievement wall uh, that formed basically a ramp going up toward the city. Uh, here are some of those fallen brick where we were just a few months ago. This is the diagram that Bryant Wood made showing the fallen brick uh, making virtually a ramp going up the retaining wall toward the tell, and this is the way they conquered the city. One of the most amazing things that he found just <laughs> made chills go up and down my spine as I looked at it. There was one portion of the wall that was still remaining. The whole wall didn't fall. There was one... You remember there was a promise that was made to one whose house was on the wall that it would be preserved. And we look at that one portion that is left and we see the house. 
I think I know who lived there. Joshua chapter 2, she let them down by a rope through the window, for her house was on the city wall, so that she was living on the wall. And she was promised that her house would be preserved. The only portion that's left. Well, I find that thrilling. We move from there to consider the story of the prophet Balaam. This has been one of the favorite objects of ridicule of the atheist. After all, he's got a talking donkey. Who in the world can believe that? And, of course, that story is preserved for us in Numbers. He was working with the Moabites, the Ammonites, the enemies of the children of Israel. As <clears throat> at the time of the Exodus, they were marching toward the Promised Land and uh, we're mowing down the people one after another, and we see what they did to this group and to that group, and the Moabites were afraid they would be conquered, and so they hired him a prophet to curse the children of Israel, uh, Balaam. At Tel Der Allah, and the, the Tel is, is a term for the mounds on which the cities were built. Usually they had been destroyed several times in the mound uh, was the accumulation of the destruction. They'd build the next city on top of it, and we find that all over Israel and in the, the, the area. But here is the Tel, Tel Der Allah. This is on the other side of the Jordan as the Jabbok River meets the Jordan. And that was excavated just a few years ago. And in this Tel, they found what was actually an administration building for the Amorites. This is not the Israelites. This is the enemies of the Israelites. And it was covered with plaster that had fallen off. But on that plaster, they had written various stories. Uh, and down at the, the base of the wall, you see the broken plaster that they then could put together, written on with black and red ink. And so, like a jigsaw puzzle, they put this back together to see what the Amorites had to say. And there were a number of administrative details that they had, but as they put that together, they found, of all things, the story of Balaam the prophet. Again, not written by the Israelites, but by the enemies. And here is one line which says, Warnings given by Balaam the son of Behor, a seer of the gods. Now this is from the 8th century B.C., a story of Balaam the prophet by the enemies of God. Numbers 22 says, So he sent messengers to Balaam, the son of Behor, at Prethor, which is near the river. They saw what Israel had done to the Amorites, <laughs> and here's what the Amorites had to say about it. And of course we continue reading the latter part of the verse, Behold, a people came out of Egypt. This relates directly to the Exodus, which the archaeologists deny today. And, of course, relates to what we read in verse 28, The Lord opened the mouth of the donkey. A crazy story? Well, we have archaeological confirmation of that story and of that prophet from the enemies of the children of Israel. I think that's awesome. This material is now on display in Armand, Jordan, uh, and you can go there and look at it in the museum. Shiloh is the way it's referred to uh, by most of the Israelis. Joshua chapter 18 verse 1 says, The whole congregation of the sons of Israel assembled themselves at Shiloh and set up the tent of the meeting there. This was the first permanent place for the Ark of the Covenant during the period of the Judges, and it stayed there for several hundred years. Uh, there, as you read further, you see pretty specific instructions uh, about where this was, and so you can get, obviously, very close. And we found a church in the area that was built about 400 years after the time of Christ, the Byzantine period, to commemorate Shiloh, the place where they had parked the tabernacle, if you please. And the floor, a beautiful mosaic floor, happened to match the dimensions of the tabernacle, and so it was thought that this was the spot that had been chosen 400 years after Christ, long after, of course, the actual event, that was on the spot where the tabernacle was. Well, uh, that's not really the case. Uh, 
just recently with further excavation on the tell, the northern part of that tell, they found that this was just to, yes, commemorate the spot, but not built on the spot. This is the gate that they found and that uh, opens the way to the path that leads up to the plateau where the tabernacle actually was. And it's so well confirmed that even the Department of Antiquities there in Israel has put up the plaque saying this in all probability is where the tabernacle stood. Up on that plateau that's been newly excavated we have this stone wall which was the base. Now you can't really get the dimensions in this picture. We'll get more in, in just a moment. But the thing that really nailed this down was they found 4th century BC inscriptions this is 800 years earlier than this Byzantine church that clearly identified this as Shiloh. Now it didn't really say welcome to Shiloh but it was pretty close. 400 years before the time of Christ and as we look at the outline here in stone we see where the tent poles were, the holes in regular intervals that go right on around and uh, were to support the, the tent, the tabernacle. Looking at this picture, you would really need to be 50 feet in the air, which was kind of hard for me to do. But with the line here, you can see the dimensions of the tabernacle, which fit beautifully. This is where the tabernacle was for well over 300 years, and where they worshipped during the period of the Judges. This was the, the capital of Israel during that period, if you please. This is where the sacrifices and the annual feasts took place, where the land was allotted to the tribes, where Eli judged and Hannah prayed and Samuel served and where Eli fell and died. Actually, it wasn't here at this spot. The text says that when he heard the story of the capture of the ark, and of the loss of the battle and the death of his sons, he was at the gate. Well, we found the gate, you recall, that leads to this place. This is where he would have been sitting and where he fell and died. From all of the evidence, it's convincing even the skeptics. One after another, we're find, this is all, this, the inscriptions were found in the last six months, so it's just almost every month we're finding new confirmation. The fortified gates of Solomon have been known for half a dozen years, but they're interesting confirmation of what we read in 1 Kings chapter 9. This is the account of the forced labor which King Solomon levied to build the house of the Lord, his own house, the Milo, this is at Jerusalem, and then also he built at Hazer and Megiddo and Gezer. Well, of course, Solomon is this fictitious creature like Zeus that uh, you know, the real scholars don't believe in. But what did he do at Hazer and Megiddo and Gezer? Well, you go there and you find these strange-looking gates that guard the city. Very <laughs> difficult to break through these gates into the city with this kind of fortification. And the places where you find these gates are at Hazer and Megiddo and Gezer. And the pottery that we find associated with the gates is from the time of Solomon. Isn't that a surprise? I think that's exactly what the text describes. That's where Solomon built. One of the most exciting bits of evidence was found a number of years ago, but brand new evidence has been uncovered within the last two years. It involved two silver amulets from the 7th century B.C., they were found in Jerusalem at uh, the place now occupied by St. Andrew's Scottish Presbyterian Church, just south of Old Jerusalem. The, find, the first find was made in 1979. Gordon Franz was the supervisor of this dig, actually under the guidance of the director of Gordon Barke, uh, who wasn't there when the actual find took place. Judith Hadley is the one who actually found the, the silver amulet. She was a grad student at Wheaton and she's now a professor at Villanova. But one of her colleagues is laying here in what was a tomb. It's a collapsed tomb. It was over him at the time this was uh, originally built. And under where he's laying is a storage area with a number of pots, pottery, uh, various artifacts. 
And it was in the corner, as Barclay is indicating in the inset there, that this amazing find was made. Silver amulets that were rolled up, but they had inscriptions on them from the Bible. This is from Numbers chapter 6, verse 24. The Lord bless you and keep you, and make the Lord make his face to shine upon you. The priestly blessing was what they, the priest wore around their neck. They inscribed this on the pieces of silver, rolled it up, and wore it as an amulet. This is from Jeremiah's time, clearly identified from the pottery, as well as from other cultural implications, and really not even contested by the liberals. Well, how did they inscribe so, so well on silver? In fact, we found with infrared technology in the last two years much more than what they originally found. <clears throat> Numbers 6, 24, uh, 25, and 26 were very obvious as we developed more technology, reported in the New York Times, by the way, just two years ago, almost the whole chapter uh, of the context is engraved on the back of it. How did they do that? I think we get a hint from Jeremiah 17, where we read, uh, the sin of Judah is written down with an iron stylus with a diamond point. It is engraved on the tablet of their heart. Evidently, they were doing some engraving with diamonds at the end of an iron stylus. And so on this, you do have the text. Now, the significance we related to this morning when we're talking about the Dead Sea Scrolls, the documentary hypothesis says these books that comprise the earliest books supposedly written by uh, Moses, the early writers, weren't, weren't written then at all, but written after the captivity. Uh, and this is what the documentary hypothesis is supposed to have proved. And we found then some of the Dead Sea Scrolls that were actual copies of the Paleo-Hebrew, which had to have been written prior to the exile, because that's the only time that style was used. Now, when they found the, the 300 B.C. copies, uh, it wasn't from before the exile, but there were copies of what was before the exile. This was not a copy. This was written before the exile. This was 400 years older than the Dead Sea Scrolls, and it is precisely like the text that we have today, identical. <clears throat> Two renditions of it and almost a whole chapter on the back side, 400 years older than the Dead Sea Scrolls. That just says the people that have given their faith to the documentary hypothesis have made fools out of themselves as they tried to deny the Word of God. We moved to Tel Dan. This is up at the northern end of Israel. Uh, we can see Mount Hermon in the background. Uh, this is the northern extremity of Israel, and there we find Dan. You remember when uh, the, the kingdom split? And you've got Jeroboam and Rehoboam. Rehoboam took the ten tribes to the north, and he set up at Dan uh, and at Bethel, altars, to keep them from going back to Jerusalem. Well, even the Department of Antiquities now have recognized that they have found that altar at Dan, and they have their signs put up that commemorates Jeroboam's altar at Tel Dan. This is a picture of that restored, the, the metal part has been restored, but they have found with the utensils uh, clear indications that that's what that is. This is uh, Dr. Clifford Wilson, who was head of excavations at Gazer for a number of years, a very strong believer in the Word of God. The utensils that they found that were used by the priests to offer the sacrifices are now in the museum there in Jerusalem. This was one of two altars, you remember, at Dan and at Bethel. Well, the altar at Bethel was destroyed, wasn't it? by the curse. Remember the young prophet and the old prophet in that story, and he cursed the altar, and it split. This one didn't, <laughs> and this one we have found. On the southern side of the city of Dan that has been excavated over a number of years, we see the gate to the city. In a number of places in the Old Testament, you read that they sat at the gates, and this is where judgment was rendered. You remember Job sat at the gates of the city, and others 
uh, had judgment rendered there. This is a scene that gives insight into that. Here's where the judge sat, the elders sat beside him. Now these uh, wooden poles, of course, have been restored, but they fit into the sockets that were there, and they were for the wooden poles, and looked just like this. Just outside that gate, another excavation took place in 1993. Here's the, where the gate was that we just looked at. Just outside an inscription that formed a steel. This is an upright stone with writing on it, commemorating some historical event, typically. It was found in 1993 by an official Providence dig. One of the objections the archaeological people make if you find something that they don't like, well, it's not a Providence dig. It wasn't under the authority of the Department of Antiquities. And most of the great finds, like the Dead Sea Scrolls, weren't found in that manner. But this was, this was by one of the leading archaeologists in Israel, a Providence dig under the, uh, the auspices of the Department of Antiquities. And it describes a battle between Hazel, king of Aram, and the kings of Judah and Israel. Again, this was written by the enemies, by the one who actually defeated Israel, and basically it's saying, I just whipped them bad. You know, I destroyed the house of David. Now, one of the statements that you find commonly in the standard textbooks is there's no reference to David, there's no archaeological evidence for this great kingdom, and we'll see some of that in a minute. And it's not so. And here is absolute proof that there was a house of David, that this claim that they never existed is just dishonest because it has been archaeologically confirmed again by the enemies of God. I've been one of the area supervisors at the City of David now for about four years and working with some, some very brave men. The City of David, we often think, refers to Bethlehem, and uh, there is a sense in which that can be called the City of David, but that's a term that was used by David to refer to the city that he conquered from the Jebusites, that was Jerusalem. 1 Samuel 5 tells us the king and his men went to Jerusalem against the Jebusites. The inhabitants of the land, they said to David, you'll not come in here, but the blind, the lame will turn you away, thinking David cannot enter here. It was a highly fortified city. This is long after they conquered the land, took possession of it, lived in it. This is uh, about the last thing that was done. Back all the way to David's time, this was a strong fortification that hadn't been conquered. Nevertheless, David captured the stronghold of Zion, that is, the city of David. And we continue to read how that happened. Verse 8, David said on that day, whoever climbs up by the way of the water shaft and defeats the Jebusites, the lame blind hated by David's soul, he shall be chief and captain. So as we read the story, we find that Joab was one who was brave enough to go up the water shaft and got inside the city, opened the gates and said, okay, fellows, come on in. And they marched in and took the city. Verse 9 says, so David lived in the stronghold and called it the city of David. And David built all around from the Milo inward. This Milo, we didn't know what that was. I think we've got a pretty good idea at this point. David became greater and greater for the Lord of hosts was with him. Then Hiram, king of Tyre, sent messengers to David with cedar trees and carpenters and stonemasons, and they built a house for David. Okay, here's this great king with these great monuments that were built, monumental buildings, and he became greater and greater. Where's the evidence? Well, there's sort of a catch-22 here. What happened? The Babylonians came in and destroyed it, didn't they? And what happens to cedar when you set fire, to it, it burns. And it, if you were find, to find this house of David, built of cedar and, of course, stone as well, then you'd know the story was false. But you don't find it. They say, well, see, it's false. <laughs> but you should find evidence. 
and foundations and indications that it was there, and indeed we do. But let's look at some historical background to the contest here over the city of David and begin with Kathleen Kenyon again. She was, uh, of course, from Oxford and is noted for modernized archaeology in Israel. That means she got people to disbelieve the Bible. She worked in Jericho from 52 to 58, as we've indicated, and spent time then uh, after she finished in Jericho at the city of David from 61 to 68. And here is her conclusion. It may seem disappointing that the excavations have discovered none of the buildings of David City. Virtually no area remains in which there's any hope of the finds of the period. The whole of this area must therefore be written off as far as any knowledge of early Jerusalem is concerned. So just forget about it. There's nothing here. Go away. Don't even look. I've looked and it's over. And a lot of people were influenced by that. She died, uh, and then Yigil Shiloh took over the excavations at the city of David and did a very courageous job. Now, he became sick uh, and died an early death. He excavated from 78 to 85 and died before his finds were published, but he refuted Kenyon's work just step by step. He's a very courageous person. Jane Cahill is in the process of publishing his work, and I have received copies of the original work, and uh, it is in the process of being published. In the meantime, uh, since he died, the digs there in the city of David have been taken over by Ronnie Rach and Ellie Sukron, who is my supervisor, one that we've worked with there for a number of years. And these, I think, are very brave men exposing the truth under fierce opposition. Now, Ronnie Rach is more of the politician he doesn't come out as brashly as Eli Sukron does, who just tells it like it is <laughs> and has gotten in some trouble, but nevertheless are fighting for the truth. On the other side, opposing what they're doing are men like Israel Finkelstein of Tel Aviv University. He's director of the Institute of Archaeology. And I think you need to know what's being said in opposition to get the context of these investigations. He says, and this was in 2003, almost no signs of monumental building operations. The mythical united monarchy is a literary construct. And from the way he's standing there, you can get an idea where he's coming from, and that's not an illusion. That's <laughs> he's not a Bible believer, obviously. In fact, he was lecturing here in the United States recently, and his seminar was entitled, What? No Moses? And of course, that's what he was contending for. His colleague, David Yashiskin, there at Tel Aviv University, made this comment in the same publication. I'm afraid the evidence regarding the magnificent Solomonic capital was not discovered because it is non-existent, not because it's still hidden in the ground. Now, that's in Israel where they have some opposition, and there's <laughs> that may sound like wild and reckless, but you haven't seen wild and reckless till you get over into Europe where they build on that and just really exaggerate. Here's uh, Niles Peter Lamech at the University of Copenhagen. Archaeological data have now definitely confirmed that the empire of David and Solomon never existed. Now, how does archaeological data confirm that something never existed? <laughs> you could confirm something did exist, but maybe you find something tomorrow that confirms it that you haven't found today. And so, anyway, that's, that's another story. Jane Cahill, the successor, uh, at least publisher, of Shiloh's material, is uh, likewise a courageous individual who's fighting back. And in Biblical Archaeological Review, 2004, she says, the most frequently voiced argument by those who challenge the historical existence of the United Monarchy is a supposed, and I'd underscore supposed, lack of archaeological evidence. Now, you don't find the palace of David with all the cedar planks in this huge structure, monumental buildings that were destroyed by Babylonians and by Romans. But still, it's appropriate to say it is a supposed lack of evidence. In most cases, she continues saying these arguments are either grossly misleading, illogical, disingenuous, or all three. Now, you might think, well, she's a little over the top here in her response. 
But let's look at the evidence first before you make that judgment and see if that kind of a statement is justified. What's the evidence for this city of David? We're looking here at the Temple Mount and the triangular area just south of the Temple Mount was the area that was occupied by the Jebusites and that's referred to as the city of David. The earliest reference to this city is from the Armana letters that date back to the 14th century BC. This is considerably, I believe, before the Exodus. And here is a letter from the ruler of Jerusalem to the Egyptian Pharaoh. And in the inset here, the, the white uh, boxed letters, you see reference to Jerusalem before the Exodus. After, of course, the Exodus, after David and his people arrived, then we likewise see evidence. This is the way uh, it has been reconstructed. This is the way they believe it appeared at the time David arrived on the scene. We see the irrigation system over on the, the right-hand side, I think the Pool of Siloam down at the bottom. Up at the top we see the temple that was ultimately built by Solomon and uh, David's palace there below that. The, th the thing that came under first investigation uh, by Cahill and by others was the area that's referred to as the stepped structure that the era is pointing to. Obviously something is going on here. Cahill tried to say it was built by numbers of different people over hundreds of years. Shiloh refuted that by sinking the square shaft that you see up at the top and with that shaft showed that the whole thing was interconnected and interdependent and had to be built at the same time not over long periods, but was built by the Jebusites and was there at the time David arrived. On the foot of this sloping stepped structure, which is the foundation of obviously something that had to be really big, what needs that kind of a foundation? It's been estimated maybe a six-story building. I mean, you wouldn't need that much foundation without it. On the foot, you see later buildings and this dates back to the end of the first temple period, just before the Babylonians marched in. And especially in, in one of these structures on the foot, the later structures, you have what's referred to as the archive building, for good reason. Important papers were kept here. Well, the papers were burned. They're not available to us. But the papers were sealed with a clay seal stamped by a signet ring or by a stamp of the official that was sending this important document. And this is where a number of them were stored because you find a lot of the seals. And when it's burned, actually the fire uh, fires the clay and helps preserve it. Fifty-one of these stamps, referred to as bully, have been found from this archive building that dates to the time of the end of the first temple period, right at the time when the Babylonians came in and burned it. As we pointed out, these seals are often used to date things, and you see the, the thing that did the impressing on the left-hand side and the stamped clay that's been fired on the right-hand side. Fifty-one of these were found, and as they began to look and read what they said, it was astounding. Here's one from Azariah, the son of Hilkiah, that's mentioned in 1 Chronicles 9. This was a member of the family of high priests who officiated at the end of the first temple period. Then we read of Jeremiah, the son of Shapan. He's one of the scribes, a high official in the court of Jehoiakim, who was the king at the time that the Babylonians came marching in, reigned at the end of the first temple period. Then Baruch, mentioned in the same verse, if you're familiar with Jeremiah, this was his scribe. He's mentioned some 26 times by Jeremiah, and we have two of Baruch's seals. Actually, one of them has his thumbprint in the back of it. This uh, rather liberal, I'd say semi-liberal, <laughs> uh, archaeology book published in 98, Archaeology in the Old Testament, says this lump of clay used to close a papyrus document was sealed by none other than Baruch, the son of Neriah, specifying here Jeremiah 36 and 4. Then the king's son, who gave the orders to seize Jeremiah, to throw him into the pit, Jeremiel, 
his seal. I mean, these were the kinds of people that would have documents with their stamp on them, and that's what we find in this archive building. Uh, the king's son is there. Actually, of the 51 bully that were found, they attest to 26 mentioned in the Bible. 26 out of the 51 you have reference to. And of course the Bible would be describing the officials of the court and uh, wow, how do you get greater, more obvious confirmation that the Bible knows what it's talking about when it describes these people. Let's move back in history to the water shaft that's mentioned that Joab went up to conquer the city. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 5, he, whoever goes up, climbs up by the way of the water shaft, defeats the Jebusite. There's been a lot of questions about this and some things that were proposed as the water shaft that, that really weren't. But there was an irrigation system, a spring, we'll look at that in just a moment, in, in, in the city of Jerusalem. And water from that spring ran down the outside edge and then there were holes that allowed the water to go out into the fields to irrigate. Well... Joab went through one of those holes, came up that water shaft, and then into the city. Today, you can walk right down that water shaft, as my wife is doing here. And uh, if you travel over there, the, the, this is one of the things you want to do, just like Joab did. The water comes from the Gihon Springs, which is, of course, mentioned numerous times in the Bible. It provides water for the city of Jerusalem, one of the few sources of water in Israel, and it's a very prolific spring. Mentioned in 2 Chronicles 32, it was Hezekiah who stopped the upper outlet of the waters of the Gihon and directed it to the west side of the city. They, of course, now occupy the city, and here comes Sennacherib ready to attack the city, the Assyrian king, and okay, maybe they're going to come up the water shaft like Joab did. So we've got to protect this. And he did so with an outer wall and by redirecting the water back to the western side of the city. Well, you look there at the spring and you can see the shaft that was cut where it's pointed toward the west side of the city. And we'll see where that shaft goes in just a moment. But there at Gihon, there was a tower that was surrounding it that formed a, a large area where Solomon was coronated. And we look to 1 Kings chapter 1. The king said, this is King David, take with you the servants of the Lord, have my son Solomon ride on my own mule and bring him down to Gihon, where the springs are. Let Zadok the priest, Nathan the prophet anoint him. They blow the trumpet. Here's a big ceremony they're going to have. And it would be in this restored area in the center of this area of pointed to by the era. That's where the spring is, and these towers were built around it to protect the spring. Well, they're not really towers. There's really just one tower we have found out now since this picture was drawn. Where is this area where the coronation took place? There was a little room, about 8 by 12, that the archaeologist said, this, this is all it could be. David Alid is one of the archaeologists who's working there with us in the city of David, was listening to one of the tour guides say this and thinking about what he read in Scripture. There were mules in here. <laughs> there was the prophets. There was a big ceremony. In this little room, this just doesn't make any sense. And he just kind of went berserk, they thought, grabbed up a sledgehammer and started beating on a wall. He says, there has to be more than this. And the wall was actually built that he was beating on by Queen Helena some 300 years after Christ. She's the mother of Constantine that made a lot of messes over there. He broke the wall down and it opened up into this huge area, not quite as big as this auditorium, but close. Certainly room for several mules in the ceremony that they're talking about, uh, as would be reflected in the area that you're looking at here. That's inside that area. There at the spring of Gihon. Water was also stored from the spring at a pool that we have determined dates back to the time of Melchizedek. But at the time Sennacherib came, they decided to fill it in because this, is, uh, this was to protect the water from anyone who would be coming, and that's uh, militarily significant. We were involved in helping to excavate that pool, which had been filled in by King Hezekiah, and you see all kinds of pottery and artifacts, idols, from the time of Hezekiah, and uh, at this point we see 
uh, my son in the center, and then a broken idol that he found uh, at the excavation there. There are several of them. Have been, every one of the idols that have been found were broken. None of, many of the jars are intact. Many of the oil lamps are intact, but all of the idols are. Well, Hezekiah didn't get along well with the idolaters, did he? He helped destroy, bring down, break down the idols, and he broke the idols before he piled them into the pool. This is the south end of a northbound calf, uh, which they typically worshipped. The text says he diverted the water to the west side of the city, and we saw this little outlet there from the, the spring that headed to the west side. Again, Second Chronicles 32, he stopped the waters of Gihon, directed them to the west side, and made the pool and the conduit, brought the water into the city. This is a diagram of what we're looking at. Here's the Gihon Spring there in red, and the dark blue line is the tunnel that Hezekiah dug to redirect the water from the original course indicated by the light blue line, which he then protected by an outer wall, as we'll see. But the water then went down this dark blue line. It was through a tunnel that he dug. Well, you can walk down those tunnels that are described in Scripture as being built by Hezekiah, and there's an inscription that was found several years ago that described how the tunnel was built. This is a picture of it. It describes beginning from either end, and as they approached, they could hear each other, and they finally met as Acts was against Acts. It gives the length of the tunnel. It's there, just like the scriptures would indicate and as confirmed by the inscription. That tunnel continued down to the pool of Siloam, the text says in Scripture, well, here's this little bitty pool that the tunnel goes to. Now, that was a puzzle because the pool of Siloam ought to be more significant than this, and it's just a little dinky thing that you can see here in this picture that the tunnel does go to, and the Scripture says, okay, it goes to the tunnel, but this is not much of a pool. And actually, what's built around it is Byzantine. It's not uh, really that old. What we found was that that's not the pool of Siloam. This blue, light blue area, lower, is a much larger pool. It's uh, well over an acre that we found in 2004. But wait a minute, the, the tunnel doesn't go down to the big pool. Well, yes, it does. <laughs> we found out last year, last summer, as we helped excavate, the, the tunnel just kept right on going past that little bitty dinky thing that they've been saying is the pool of Siloam for years to the big pool. Let's go back up to the Gihon Springs where there were towers built around to provide it. And that tower, I think, is referred to in Scripture in Luke chapter 13, but it's pointed to here by the era. And remember Jesus said, do you suppose these 18 on whom the tower fell and killed were worse culprits than all the men in it? 18 people were killed here. And sure enough, we found where that tower had fallen and these huge stones that were probably laid there by the, the, the Jebusites had fallen, and uh, that was what had been protecting. Uh, this is where 18 people were killed, and uh, actually uh, we got a 19th. Uh, no, that's actually my son here posing as one of the 19th. Uh, he found the... Uh, the vertebrae here of a donkey right next to the tower as we were excavating and came up with the theory that maybe the donkey kicked the tower over. I don't think so, but <laughs> we're enjoying ourselves as we're uh, excavating in this area. The wall of Hezekiah is a very impressive find found by Eli Sukron. Again, back in Second Chronicles 32, Hezekiah saw that Sennacherib had come intended to make war on Jerusalem. He took courage, rebuilt all the wall that had been broken down, erected towers on it, and built another outside wall. So in addition to redirecting the water to the west side, he built an outside wall that we see here, protecting what Joab had climbed up through. And here it is. Kenyon referred to this specifically, said it didn't exist. There's no wall. If there was a wall, I would have found it. Well, if she had been a good, if she'd been looking for it, I think she'd have found it. Obvious, I mean, this is hard to miss. This is huge. But when you're not looking for it and don't believe it's there, then it's easy to miss. 
and she did, but it's, uh, it's obviously there, just as described in Scripture. On the west side, the far extremity, there were, there's a description of the wall that was built when Nehemiah was rebuilding the walls in uh, chapter 2, verse 17. He rebuilt the wall of Jerusalem. Verse uh, 8 of chapter 3 says, They restored Jerusalem as far as the broad wall. This is as far as in the western direction goes. Well, you go to the western side and you look at the wall and there it is and it's 23 feet across. <laughs> that's the broadest part of that rebuilt wall and uh, that's exactly the way it's described. The tombs of the house of David were one of the things Kenyon referred to and said there's no reference to the tomb. And 1 Kings 2 says that David slept with his fathers, was buried. Well, if you find some of the tombs of the prophets, and there are several there, you ought to certainly find where David was buried. Well, we did. <laughs> uh, it was difficult because Queen Helena had made this her quarry and I think it was a beautiful edifice initially, several indications of that. But you see where the, the square areas are. She's quarrying stones here to build her buildings and had destroyed this. But even the liberals now acknowledge, yes, this is David's and Solomon's tombs. And they were probably beautiful before Queen Helena destroyed them. The walls that surrounded the temple, a few portions of that do remain. Remember, of course, the story of the Romans marching in, destroying Herod's temple, and a portion of the retaining wall, not the temple, but the retaining wall is seen here in what's referred to often as the Wailing Wall or the Western Wall. The upper portion that you can just barely see, the smaller stones, was built by the Crusaders. The midsection was done by Hadrian, but the lower section, the much bigger, more elaborate stones were laid down by Herod, and actually they continue about 30 feet below the street level there. You can't see all of it, but here are some of those large stones that Herod built, and you can see the bosses around the edges. The southern extremity of that same wall was excavated about 15 years ago, and it's really interesting. Again, you see the small stones up top that were done by the Crusaders and then at the base, Herod's Wall. But notice this structure here in the side. It probably looked like this. In fact, there's real good indication that it did. It's referred to as Robinson's Arch. He ac excavated and found this a, a good while back, uh, about 100 years ago, uh, though they had not excavated below that. But this is where that arch connected and led to shops, the first century shops that are down here in the foreground, the arched over a first century street. But all of uh, where, where the Crusaders have built here, there were huge buildings, very elaborate buildings that came tumbling down when the Romans destroyed this. Again, not the temple walls, but here the retaining wall around the temple. And what we see at the base of that wall and is where those huge stones hit that first century street and just pummeled it, destroyed it, uh, which is exactly what we read about in Scripture. So those walls, together with the fact they have fallen, all testifies to just exactly what we read about in Scripture. As we read the description of the Temple Mount and the Pool of Siloam and uh, this area of the city of David, we read of the stairs that go down to the pool, Nehemiah 3, when they're rebuilding it, spoke of the pool of Siloam and the stairs that go down from the city of David. Well, about 10 years ago, a Bible-believing archaeologist excavated on the south side where they would be going down and found the stairs that go down, according to the Scriptures, to the pool of Siloam. Now, it's about half a mile down there, and so we haven't got all of them, but they began looking at these stairs. Now, these would be significant. These are the stairs Jesus stood on. These are the stairs the apostles stood on. Right here is the gate beautiful, the edifice built into it, covering it up, built by, guess who? <laughs> Queen Helena, Constantine's mother, who made all kinds. Of, why did she build it? I'm not sure. I don't know. 
But she covered up the gate beautiful. But right below where that era is, is where uh, the lame man in Acts chapter 3 jumped up. And uh, that's where uh, Peter and John were preaching. As we turn to the right, we can see those stairs extending along the southern extent of the Temple Mount and toward Mount of Olives in the, the, the background. Uh, we're reminded of the statement that from the Temple to the Mount of Olives was a Sabbath day's journey. How long is that? Well, there it is. <laughs> you can see. And as you turn back around to the right again, you see down those stairs toward the city of David, actually a little bit more to the right. Going down those stairs, we have sunk shafts, and those stairs do continue all the way down to the Pool of Siloam, though we couldn't find them as we neared the pool. This is referred to in John 9, where Jesus told the blind man, go wash in the Pool of Siloam. As we suggested in 2004, we finally found the real pool, which is uh, this green area covered by the fig trees and the pomegranates owned by the Anglican Church, who say, this is our fig tree grove, and you can't have it. <laughs> uh, we're negotiating at this point. But in June of 2004, they were repairing a sewer pipe, and as they did, they found these steps going down. Eli Sukron immediately recognized this as the Pool of Siloam, though he was ridiculed by many. By November of that year, uh, when we were there, we took this picture. Obviously, much more had been excavated. And then by June of 2005, it looked like this. Now, we still don't have a permit. We have a permit to fix the sewer pipe, and so we're fixing the daylights out of that sewer pipe. <laughs> <laughs> but this is what we believe the pool looked like from some shafts that we have been able to sink in, in various areas. You could have baptized 3,000 people there all at the same time. A magnificent pool. The Temple Mount is back to the left. This escarpment over here is blocking the way. And where are the stairs that go up to the Temple Mount? Well, there were stairs that we found over here, and they led to a plaza with a colonnade, and we thought, well, maybe they go this direction, and then they turn and go back to the north. The more we excavated, the more we realized that was not the case. But here is the, the extension, as we showed, that goes all the way down to the Pool of Siloam. We have been excavating there since 2004. And here's my wife working with Ronnie Rach here in the red shirt, one of the supervisors. And this is the way it looked this uh, past June. Obviously a huge pool, but where are the stairs? Well, this escarpment over here on the right is, is blocking the way, and we kept looking... Here's the description again from Nehemiah chapter 3. He repaired the wall by the pool of Siloam, the steps going down from the city of David. Well, uh, here we see one of the supervisors marching toward the area, and this era is pointing to what was found just a few months ago. There was an area in this escarpment that was just a little too symmetrical. <laughs> it had been filled in with the debris from the destruction of Jerusalem, and it covered over this huge tunnel that went through the escarpment. And so you see the, the wooden stairs there just barely that lead right up to that area. And as we stepped through that, we saw, wow, there are the stairs that we've been looking at that go right on up to the Temple Mount. We learned more about that from Josephus who describes these stairs and a tunnel that's underneath them. It was a sewage tunnel originally, but here we read news had reached him that many had earlier escaped from the sieges of Jerusalem and collect there. But they were trying to get out of Jerusalem when siege was laid by the Romans. Arriving there at the spot, that is the Romans, they found these Jews who were in this tunnel down under the stairs and he ordered the infantry to break down into the streets under the stairs, and you can see where the holes are broken there in, this, in the stairway. And they poured boiling oil down into the tunnel and killed 3,000 Jews, according to Josephus. Of course, many more killed in the siege, but this was one of the tragedies. 
we can go into that tunnel, we can see where they were, and here you see the stairs uh, above them and the tunnel below, and we have ex that has been extended in the last few months, and it gets much larger, about 10 feet high. Notice the statement by Eli Sukron, who's one of the directors there of the city of David. He says, many of the Jews tried to escape Jerusalem. When the Romans pursued them, they broke the flagstones and descended into the canals of the drainage system, hiding for days uh, at a time, as described by Josephus Flavius. You know what we discovered here in the tunnels? We found cooking vessels, pots with the remains of food inside, which Josephus, by the way, had mentioned. Stone vessels, other objects still preserved from that era. Our assumption is that these vessels were used by the Jews who were hiding there until they were caught by the Roman soldiers. Now, if you look in our artifact room, you'll see one of those pots that he refers to that the Jews were carrying with them when they were burned alive in the tunnel. A much larger portion has just been revealed and was announced September the 11th of this year. And so this is an ongoing saga. But we found it because we believe what the Bible said. And we're looking exactly where the Bible said it should be, and that's where we found it. Let me mention one more thing before we conclude this evening. This was announced in the New York Times in 2005. King David's palace is found. <laughs> the thing that Kenyon said is not there, don't look, just forget it. An Israeli archaeologist says she's uncovered in the East Jerusalem what may be the fabled palace of the biblical King David. King Tyre sent messengers to David with cedar trees, carpenter, stone masons. They built a house for David. So King Tyre is, Tyre is the, the capital of Phoenicia, and he's building a house for David. Of course, he married his daughter. And so we would look for a Phoenician-style palace in the middle of Jerusalem, which would be you know, rather easy to identify, and that's exactly what Alot Mazar has found. She's with Hebrew University. It was her grandfather who found those steps on the southern part of the Temple Mount that uh, there beside the Gate Beautiful. Where is this monumental building? Well, <laughs> here is a monumental building that she found. It is huge. This is what was uncovered actually just... Uh, this picture was able to be taken this year, and that's just a part of it. It continues on the other side of the street. It's at least six stories high. And from this picture on the other side of the street where we were working this past summer, you can see the levels as it goes down and down and down. It is huge. Monumental is uh, <laughs> almost a trivial word by comparison. And it was a joy to be able to work there and to be able to help excavate this. You can get a little bit of idea of the work that's going on. Looking at the pottery, we found that this was clearly identified. Some of it pictured here in place as it was being uncovered is from the 10th century, which is definitely identifying it as the time of David. The location is seen just below the Temple Mount, as indicated here by this square. And notice her description of how she found it. And this is from the New York Times. Archaeology is technical, but you dig with a mind open to historical sources, and anything can help. I work with the Bible in one hand, the tools of excavation in the other, and try to consider everything. One of the main clues in finding David's palace, says Mazar, was surprisingly from the Bible itself. David, uh, 2 Samuel 5, 17, uh, heard about it, went down from his palace to the citadel. He knew where the citadel was. The palace has to be up above. And so she published in one of the technical journals, this is where the Bible says it ought to be. I need to raise some money. I want to go dig. This is a test of what the Bible says before anything was found. And that's where she dug, and she found it just exactly as she had published that she should find it. Notice the way this is analyzed, I think, scientifically in one of the commentaries there from Jerusalem. We have a biblical text describing in detail the creation of a Phoenician-style palace by David high up on a particular mountain. You've got a particular mountain, you've got a Phoenician-style palace, we've got the text describing it, around the end of the 11th, beginning of the 10th century, uh, before the current era. 
then we have a grand structure of the Phoenician style dating from the same time on the summit of that very mountain located with the assistance of the text and previous archaeological discoveries. This was not stumbled upon, moreover, but carefully hypothesized, and the current dig was proposed as a test. The likelihood of this happening by chance is extremely small. And I think you just have to say amen. This is the way science should proceed. It did and it's confirmed. Sorry, liberals, that's just the way it is. <laughs> so, let's summarize looking at the evidence of the stones. Begin with the altar of Joshua on Mount Ebal, the Gilgal stones from Jordan, the fallen walls of Jericho and Rahab's house, the Balaam inscription, the Shiloh Plateau, the fortified gates of Solomon, the Hebrew text from Jeremiah's time, the Jeroboam's altar at Dan, and the house of David inscription. And then we get to the city of David, and we see first the 14th century cuneiform tablets identifying it before the Exodus, the stronghold of Zion, uh, this stepped structure, the administration buildings built on the foot of it with 51 bully, uh, 26 characters from scripture identified, Joab's water shaft, the Gihon spring, the coronation site found because he believed what the Bible said, the pool of Melchizedek, the tunnels of Hezekiah, the tower of Siloam that fell, Hezekiah's wall, huge wall, the rebuilt walls, the broad walls, the tombs of David and Solomon, the pool of Siloam, the stairs from the temple down to the pool and the palace of David, monumental palace almost 200 yards across and six stories high. Jane Cahill was telling the truth when she says there's a supposed lack of archaeological evidence. And she's not over the top when she says in most cases the arguments denying this are grossly misleading, illogical, disingenuous, or as I would say, all three. Or to put it in Texas terms, they're just lying through their teeth when they say there is no evidence for the city of David. Grossly misleading, illogical, and disingenuous. We'll conclude with a statement again by Adam Zetrel. He's been surveying Manasseh now for 20 years, beginning as an atheist and winding up as a believer. He says, after years of research, however, I believe it's impossible to explore Israel's origins without the Bible. Again and again, we have seen the historical value of the Bible. Again and again, we've seen that an accurate memory has been preserved in its transmuted narratives, waiting to be unearthed and exposed, not just by imagined stories in the Sunday school lesson, but by archaeological fieldwork and critical mind work. This is uh, referring to his effort there in the Manasseh survey. The area is relevant in particular for the reliability of the early Bible. Nearly a thousand new sites. Now, this is what he's found in the 20 years of the survey, just in the Manasseh area. A thousand new sites that can be referenced in Scripture create a new archaeological reality, which connects the books of Deuteronomy and Joshua and Judges to the territory where they have happened. Now, a thousand data points is pretty heavy. I mean, that's... <laughs> how do you argue with that? That's just... I think, unanswerable, which is what he's saying. And so when we consider the actual evidence, apart from the political battles and the religious denials, uh, the evidence is just overwhelming. And we have exactly what Peter commands us to give, a ready defense, a reason for the hope that's in us, that we'll stand and uh, will embarrass the opposition. 